So hello again, everybody. I am the Fedora Operations Architect. Uh, this presentation is about the Fedora Operations Architect, um, who I am, where I come from, what I'm doing, what I'm going to do, and kind of anything else that you want to ask. So without further ado, first thing is first, why would the project need an operations architect? So all good things sometimes start from a bad place. And the Fedora project found itself with a fair amount of uncertainty earlier this year. A lot of sad, bad things happened. We don't need to go into it all again because it's just upsetting. We've come out stronger the other side, but I just wanted to acknowledge that you know, there was some layoffs, etc., that put the, the the future of the project in just a little bit of uh, troubled times. But like I said, the Fedora project is quite resilient. It's made of a lot of people who are willing to help one another, willing to pull through in to the bad times, um, and people are willing to help. You know, they, they would rather they would rather sacrifice their time than see the project suffer and that's an incredible place to be. And it it paid dividends. F39 was still released and a huge, huge congratulations to everybody who was involved. It was a quite a tough release. There was a lot of key people missing for it. Um, but people banded together and they got the head to, down and F39 was released. So kudos to that. But like I said, you know, because it was a tough release, I don't think anybody wanted to repeat that. So an operations architect was how we were going to pull forward through the project. Um, it is how we would replace gaps that were left in the project. But what is it? So it's a new term, and I don't think it existed in the project before this. There is a lot of familiarities from a previous position that was held by Ben Cotton. God rest him. Um, <laughs> it uh, looks a lot like the Fedora program management position. A lot of it is responsible for those things, the change process, you know, including the announcements, the triaging, the making sure that everything is in place, the bug tracking that goes with it. To be honest, you could do the change process as a job on its own. It is that wide. <laughs> so um, I could see why this was needed to be looked after. There is also the elections and the reporting that the floor program manager used to do. That's still important to the project, one of the key cornerstones of it, and they still have to continue. So I'll be continuing to do the elections and the reporting. Excuse me, I need to take a drink. Man, it was one of those days. Anyway, like I was saying, so elections and reporting, the Fedora Friday Facts will be resumed effective next week for sure. Uh, it is a really useful piece of, report, of, um, of information that Ben used to send out and I'm happy to continue that legacy. Um, there's also the release coordination will be a part of the Fedora operations architect position as it was with the Fedora program management. A lot of moving parts in the Fedora project twice a year, every year. So it does need somebody that will just oversee everything, make sure that people are talking to the right, the right teams at the right times. Uh, deadlines can come up really fast, especially the, the change checkpoints. You know, there was if those deadlines are not being monitored and there's a lot of change processes, things can slip through the cracks. And I think that was one of the biggest issues that the Fedora project faced with the F39 release. So that all falls in under the release coordination. Um, and then also council coordination. You know, there's uh, I know Ben played a huge part in making sure that the council meetings were productive and they kept on track and there was an agenda, etc. And that is a job in itself as well. <laughs> Uh, from somebody who's had a lot of experience with administration and uh, secretarial work and bookkeeping, there's you'd be surprised how needed one person is to just keep everybody else on track. So council coordination will continue as part of the Fedora operations architect role. But there might be some other new stuff that I am happy to get involved with. You know, we now use discourse as a means of communication and discussion. Um, that will be, need to be moderated. There's a lot of vocal people on the discourse chat channels, and that's wonderful to see. Um, but we don't want it to get us contentious and upset people. So there will be moderation to make sure that the, the language people are using is correct and everybody feels in a safe space to share their opinion. 
without being attacked. But also, you know, the topics need to be closed. Some things are not in re relevant anymore. It, it definitely could do with a little TLC around optics and maybe the UI. So not only moderating the, the conversation, but also the, the actual site itself. Um, and with a team of people, like no, not one person owns discourse, um, Matthew. <laughs> and I know you don't either, but to clear, spell it out. So we'd be looking to adopt a, a discourse team that will help with this moderation and, and that kind of stuff. Um, I'm also going to help with the Fedora events when I'm needed. I love event planning, love scheduling, things like this. So happy to help Justin and others. And I know there's there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes around maybe like a little events planning team. You know, the DEI team have a lot of stuff coming up and the creative, the, the creative Freedom Summit also has roots in Fedora. So I'm happy to get involved in those kind of areas too. Um, because I have a background with as a product owner, uh, a lot of that may still be appropriate in this role. And like I said, with the release coordination, a lot of moving parts in Fedora, there is sometimes a need for somebody to act as a sort of product owner that will go and speak to adjacent teams or teams within Red Hat that are using Fedora that might have work that they're doing that has either effect on the project or they want to see something in the project, but they're not really sure how to get involved. Um, the operations architect will be there to help kind of guide them through our processes and make sure that they're adhering to our standards. Um, and also just to, to as a signpost person to point them to the right teams that, you know, if they're getting involved with KDE, that they know that they can speak to the KDE SIG or the, uh, the insert many SIGs here. <laughs> There's too many to even think of. Um, but also to, the change process would have similar to requirements gathering stuff that you would see in a product owner style role as well to vet those processes too. And as of yesterday, <laughs> I will be assisting with the Fedora legal issue tracking. Uh, not to be super clear, I cannot comment or approve anything legal. I'm not a lawyer, but I am more than happy to be that point person that will accept the issues, that will make sure that they're being processed along to the right teams, the right people, working with maybe the internal folks at Red Hat that if they're not an actual legal issue, that they don't just sit in a queue and never to be reported on again, that I will bring that information back out to the requester to make sure that there's a constant flow of information and things continuously move. They don't just hit blocker after blocker after blocker until they die. So um, I'm happy to kind of be that flow through the, uh, the legal side of things, adjacent teams, helping with discourse, et cetera. So, that could be some new things that may not have been part of the program manager role, but should be part of the operations role because we're trying to encompass the entirety of the project. And basically anything else that needs doing. <laughs> so if you do need help, I might not be able to fix the problem, but I am happy to listen. I'm happy to figure out who maybe you should talk to instead to fix it. I seem to know a lot of people in a lot of places, so don't ever feel shy of reaching out and asking, hey, I'm doing this thing on the my my workstation and it's not working. Do you know how I can fix this? Um, probably not. I don't come from a technical background, but I can certainly point you to the Ask Fedora part of discourse, maybe directed to a matrix room that I know has people working on this issue in, uh, direct you to any, any number of bugger issue trackers or the common bugs page. So uh, also if you need help and you're not really sure, um, about how to handle a situation, or if you just want to talk, please do reach out to me. I seem to be kind of a, a good person to be able to get weird things that fit in a gray area that nobody knows what to do with done. So I think that kind of brings me, yeah, that brings me to the end of the like, this is the job that I'm in spiel. I hope it's making sense. I have my screens minimized, so I can't really see much of the comments, but I'm, I'm assuming you'll be kind. Uh, okay, so, uh, yeah, everything looks fine. Who am I? Who am I and what do I do? Well, we've already spoken about what I do. <laughs> it's me, Mario. No, uh, obviously not. But I'm kind of sick of seeing this photograph in uh, all over the place this weekend. 
So I was sitting down to tidy up these slides last night and I was like, oh, that would be funny. I had a Mario Kart one as well, but my partner advised me to maybe take it out. Anyway, I am based in Waterford, Ireland. It is known as the sunny southeast, but like this is our sunshine here, folks. See all those clouds? Yeah, I'd love to know who thought that name was appropriate. Anyway, I am a fluent swearer. I will try not to because this is recorded and uh, I do feel a little bit bad. My mother would kill me if she knew that I was swearing, even though she'd probably say, Aoife, for sake, what are you swearing for? The irony. Um, I do have 14 years or so customer service of every kind, which I will show you. And then Matthew can ask all of his aviation questions that he wants. Um, and I'm also a mother, a sister, a daughter, a partner, and probably a person of interest, although <laughs> who knows. What I have done in my life to reach this point um, felt like writing a little CV. I did, in fact, spend two weeks wrapping presents at a department store in Waterford. I will tell you the worst present that I ever wrapped from somebody was a fire grate and a footstool. I'm 16 at this point. It's my first kind of like job job. A pet cat, of course, I'd say I was just stuck in there just to just as a little novelty. But people really kind of ran away with the idea. So like I was handed two sets of wrapping paper. There was the fancy wrapping paper for the perfumes and the cosmetics that are being bought, but only, you know, of a certain brand. So like your Chanel's, your Dior's, your, you know, that kind of stuff. No problem. If you're buying L'Oreal, no, use the regular wrapping paper. But uh, yeah, the, this, this guy came in one day and bought a fire guard. Um, I don't know whether that translates when where everybody knows what that means, but it's if you have an open fire and it's just literally the piece that goes in front of it. Um, yep, yeah, I had to wrap that for him. He was buying it for his grandmother. I was like, no, you're not. You're not buying it for anyone. You just want this wrapped. But fine, I was getting paid nonetheless. And then a footstool, like a big giant kind of like poof footstool. So I think after that, they got very strict on what, what, uh, what could be wrapped and what couldn't be wrapped because I had to request more wrapping paper. And they're like, where is it all going? So then I told them then they were like, oh, for God's sake. So then I got a little sign saying, Present, these are the types of presents that we can, we can wrap. So yeah, that was funny. 10 years as a passenger services agent. So I will stop here for questions because I know Matthew surely has one. How do, okay, uh, there are three questions so far. I will get to the Git Forge one at the end. That deserves a little bit more conversation. We'll stick to the funny stories one for now. The Fedora operations comparing to a small airport. Well, funny you ask. So the small airport had, was quite busy at times. At other times it was quite quiet and it was peaceful and it was nice to be there. But at times it ramped up, which was flight time. Um, I will liken that to release times. Most of the time, the Fedora product is nice and things tip away quite calmly. And, you know, there's people have time to think and process things. But every so often, twice a year, there is the release and it's all panic. All systems go. You have to meet a deadline. Make sure that the manifests are correct. Make sure that the, the bags are tagged. <laughs> make sure that the uh, RCs are correct. Make sure that all the bugs are tracked. Like there are a lot of comparisons. Uh, so I would like to to that. Uh, the airport was funny because there was a small number of people working there and if one person got sick there wasn't a million people to like row back row in and help out so I remember there was one day that we would have three kind of stations to be covered by a, a passenger services agent so you'd have your information desk which would kind of cover you know reservations and general queries or uh yeah, general queries. Then you'd have your check-in desk, which is what I would have usually done, which would be processing all of the, the passengers as you come in and you check your bags and the rest. Um, they all had command line systems as well, by the way. The the whole thing was was all through a command line. So it was all um, it was all commands, it was all like it was all logic that I had to write in, which was interesting. Um, and then there was obviously the security, which was more of a hands-on, like, you know, is there any liquids and gels in your bag? Are you wearing a belt? Are you wearing any jewelry? Is there any change in your pocket? That kind of crap. Um, 
there was one day that the person who was supposed to be on security called in sick and the information desk person was sick. So it was just me who was supposed to be on check-in. There was 70 or 80 people on the flight and I had to cover the entire three stations. And you had to board the flight as well. So that was a, that was a time crunch. I would compare that to the latest Fedora release in uh, their go, no go meetings when there was people out sick um, and there was spots that needed to be filled. And, you know, there was the same people doing all of the different jobs in a certain, a certain amount of time trying to make it work. But the flight didn't get, the, no, did the flight get delayed that day? I don't know. The flight left, the release happened, we all breathed a sigh of relief. And we all made changes to make sure that nobody was that uncomfortable or that under pressure again. So that, I hope that kind of answers a little bit of that one. I spent two years as a reservations agent at the Waterford Castle Hotel. So that was a an interesting experience. Um, met a lot of different people, a lot of uh, highbrow people with lowbrow money. Um, <laughs> they weren't just high class as they thought they were. Um, but it was nice. It was, uh, it, I learned a lot. I learned a lot of how to work with very difficult people. Um, that's kind of where my whole, like people are full. The world is full of bad people. Let's not be one to each other because some, I found that to be a very challenging place to work together. Um, but it, it did set me up to be able to deal with other challenging people because you have to be able to work as a team and just get through it. Um, two years then as a office coordinator at Red Hat, which was where I was first introduced to this concept of open source and um, open source the way that Red Hat was doing it. And they did touch out in Fedora, but I didn't really understand the Fedora project until I became the professional cat herder of the community platform engineering team. And that really did expose me to the Fedora community properly. And I loved it. Um, I said in my opening remarks yesterday, and I'll say it again today, I instantly felt at home in this community. Uh, I, I can't explain why. It's just one of these feelings that I got. I got it when I started at Red Hat, and I got it when I, when I started working with the Fedora community. I worked with one or two other communities that I didn't have that like nice feeling with, but I just kind of felt understood. Um, so I am um, now exclusively working with the Fedora community and I could not be happier. Who are in my spare time have a son Charlie so I spend it with him I'm spending it with him right now even though he doesn't know it and doesn't care. I know he does. Um, I have a family who I'm very close with my partner Evan who's beside me and some friends. We attend a lot of weddings. We have a big friend group and everybody was getting married the last couple of years except for the COVID part um, so we've been We've been at more weddings than I'd say some people have had hot dinners this year. If you ever need occasion where people of the Fedora, <laughs> of the Fedora community, I'm, I'm, I'm a good person to, to send a dress if you need it. But we have lots of ponies as well. This is where I, most of my free time goes and my partner Evan will vouch for that. Even though I'm at a soccer match, I have spent the last three and a half hours outside with the ponies, which is why my face is a little bit flushed. We have Vanessa. Magic, Paddy, Victor, because ponies are continued, Philip, uh, Nula is the pony, and this is my niece, Amy, in the red jacket. This was her winning the uh, National Under 12 Championships this year. We couldn't have been prouder. Philip is, uh, Philip is a sensory pony. So he, um, he doesn't like a lot of noises and commotion and we he, that's a sensory mask that he wears to, to kind of make him a little bit more at ease and we love him he is so cute we also have josh who's a superstar <laughs> he is uh he's our top pony in the yard for sure um he's one of my son's favorites although to be fair charlie's favorite is philip um but josh is second and then joe and Joe was fifth in the under 16 national championships this year. So we were extremely proud there as well. So that's, how many is that? That's eight, there are more. I did vet this slide deck with my niece and my son earlier and they're like, oh, what about 
uh, Sharon and what about Darren and what about they were listing off all the ponies I was like no I'm just going to stick to the ones that are like the, the main ones we also have two dogs as well and um, they're in the yard they, they technically belong to my sister but they're kind of like they're everybody's pooches um, this is Nasher he is completely fine he fell asleep in his food but he kept eating it uh, lightning <laughs> he's not he's not quite as dangerous as that he couldn't be more couldn't be more softer um but they are best friends and i think that is kind of who i am what i do these are things that i i live by and i believe in wholeheartedly that what is for you doesn't pass you even though it feels like it did i'm not going to say that everything happens for a reason because we know that that's not really that true but right the right thing for you if it's truly right if it's truly yours i, I do believe doesn't pass you um and like i said I, I used a swear word yesterday and i won't today um but the world has enough bad people in it and we do not need to be bad to each other we can show kindness and it costs us nothing so that's it hope it wasn't too preachy or boring um my contact details are there. You can reach me via email, on Matrix, on IRC. They're kind of the main ones. Um, I hope you enjoyed this short introduction. I'm sorry if I spoke for way too long, but I will go to the Q&A. All right. <laughs> um, so I like, I like your question, Benson. I'll start with the pony ones first. How many ponies is too many ponies? Um, two. Two is lovely. Three is getting messy. We have multiples. So many ponies. And it sounds really silly of like, oh, how can you have too many ponies? You can have too many ponies when you have to do all of those stables. Yeah, that's, that's when it gets a lot. All of the stables, all of the feeding, all of the exercise. So two is a sweet spot three is too much six is right out <laughs> one is too little um do we have pony data yes they all have passports so like the the ones that most ponies will have passports actually yeah um our ones have passports they have their national identity part of it but they also have um international sections of it too um no, I fucking can't, Marv. This is on record. The da the the app. So there is a national um, national show jumping sji.ie. They have all of like the shows listed, and they have all of the riders and all of the ponies. So they have like loads of data stored in a database. It hurts my my eyes every time I have to use it. It is just so not intuitive. I'd love to tear the whole thing down and give it to some people working in open source because they would have this thing singing if they could. I have so many ideas for it, but um, yeah, ironically, they do. Uh, Prove that I really cursed. Can I explain the offside rule in soccer? Yes, but only using handbags. Um, I'll make it quick. <laughs> and I don't remember how I saw this. I think my mother explained this to me. So if you are waiting, and my partner is shaking his head, it's like, he can't wait to hear this. But apparently, if you're waiting in a line of hand for a handbag that goes on sale, and you're waiting in a line and another person is waiting in a line as well. And then the handbag goes on sale. If you move before your friend has thrown her, your purse to you, then that's offside because you both have to go together. Does that make sense? That's how I understand it anyway. Uh, right. So let's talk quickly about the GitForge future. So I am speaking with wearing my old CPE product, uh, community platform engineering product owner hat on. Uh, I know there are some folks in that team who are running an investigation currently about all of the integrations that the services that build and release Fedora Linux. I'm only talking about build and release uh, services right now. They are investigating how many of those are very tightly coupled with PAG your Diskit, how much work they would be to reconfigure to be a bit more agnostic and how many of them would need to be completely rewritten like so they're trying to determine whether there's services that could just have a bit of maybe they need a config change or maybe maybe they need new api mapping or, or something to integrate with insert git forge here um, endpoints or whether 
and how many then are just completely customly written for PAG or Diskit. When they have the results of that investigation, I think that will set us up for a much better idea of the body of work that we as a project would have to do to move off the current uh, Git forge. Um, I'm disinclined to say anything more about that until we kind of really understand what we're working with. Uh, but the future of it will certainly be that once we have the results of that investigation, then as my my job as the operations architect, I will be acting in that kind of product owner way and gathering some requirements, et cetera, from other working groups and stakeholders within the project to make sure that we are now getting a wider picture. When we know what we're dealing with, build and release, let's let's get a wider picture then of the requirements for that. Um, it is not, it is moving. We are still going to maintain it. I do apologize. No, it's not directly my fault, but I do apologize anyway, because this this started with a bang and has never really resolved, but I hate leaving loose ends. So I will make sure that you have somebody to kind of follow it now. So I will be making sure that this, this has a resolution. Can't promise that it will be in the short term, but it certainly will be resolved soon, TM. Uh, where would the virus data go if the referee is using Linux? I don't know. They might have to make a custom, a custom directory for that one. Okay, so going to end it there. I think I've spoken way too much. Apologies for that. And yeah, hope you enjoyed it. It was lovely talking to you. You know where to find me if you need me.